If you have your Bibles this morning, we want to invite your attention to Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. And we will begin our study from that text in just a few moments, but we'll only stay there for a few minutes once we get there. We're going to be moving around the Scriptures this morning, and so we hope that you've got your Bibles ready and be ready to study the Word of God with us. Most of our young people have made it back to school by now, and I can always remember each year when I would go back to school, I always looked forward to that first week because I would get to be reacquainted with the friends that we had lost contact with over the summer, have the ability to make new friends, but also I liked it because the teachers, they went back and kind of went over the basics of the things that we had studied before. They wanted us to put in remembrance so that they could go and build on that foundation starting the next week. Well, spiritually speaking, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, the Apostle Peter is going to talk about putting them in remembrance. And he was going to be reminding them of basic spiritual truths. We read over in Hebrews 5 and verse 12 where the Hebrews writer talks about them as the first principles. Those first principles, they're very of vital, they're of great importance. The English Standard uh, describes them as basic principles. Well, one of the basics of Christianity is understanding who we are. Have you ever had somebody describe you as being different? You ever had somebody describe you that way? Maybe perhaps because you're a Christian? Or maybe because you're a member of the churches of Christ. There was a lady one time who was a member of the church who began to invite some of her co-workers to come and be with her the following Sunday at their Sunday morning worship services. And she got to this one lady and this one lady said, you know, I'll think about it. And so that Wednesday night, that particular lady, she went to the denominational group that she was affiliated with, and she began to talk with her pastor. And she said, I was invited to go to the so-and-so Church of Christ this Sunday morning for their worship. And she said, I'm seriously thinking about it. I'm considering it. And he looked at her, and his reply was this, Are you sure you want to do that? Those people are different. When we think about Christianity, God expects us to be different. God expects you and me to be peculiar. When we think about that word peculiar for just a few moments this morning, it, it can be defined in a number of ways in our secular world. It, it's described as someone who is different. It can be described as someone who is unique, someone who doesn't follow the norm, someone who may be a little bit unusual. And this not only can attach itself to a person, but it can also attach itself to a group as well. You know, when we think about it scripturally, though, and we consider what this definition means, we see that word, it can be found numerous times in the Old Testament, but only two times in the New Testament. Under the Old Testament, the word peculiar carried with it the idea of a treasured or a special possession. In the New Testament, the idea of peculiar is something that is special. And so whenever we read it in those two passages in the New Testament, it's going to be describing a special people. Well, this morning what we want to do is try to attach all three of those definitions, if you will, that we are God's special possession. And God has always wanted His special possession to be distinctive. You can go back to the Old Testament and you study the children of Israel. And you study the things that are going on in their life. 
You study the law of Moses and everything that had to go with the law. And you look at some of those restrictions that they had, possibly with their dietary restrictions, things that they couldn't partake of, but also things that they were to partake of. The law was designed to set them apart from other groups. The way that God led them was described, it was designed to set them apart from every other group because they were God's special treasured possession. But then you get over here to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and they have this great desire, and they make this demand, make us a king so that we can be like all the other nations. Guess what they didn't want? They didn't want to be different anymore. They didn't want to be distinctive anymore. They wanted to be just like everyone else. This morning, when we think about this idea of peculiar, we want to ask ourselves three basic questions. Number one, in what ways are we supposed to be peculiar? Number two, why is it so difficult to be peculiar? And then finally, number three, how do we become peculiar? Let's begin with that first one and let's try to answer it. In what ways are we supposed to be peculiar? Well, a general statement would be kind of a blanket statement. In every aspect of our life, we are supposed to be different. We're supposed to be distinctive from the world. You know, in John seventeen seventeen, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We're being set apart from the world. We're being set apart from the darkness. But as we think about it and look at it in more specific terms, you know, we're going to be distinctive, we're going to be different, we're going to be peculiar in our lifestyles. When we think about this idea of being faithful to God, how would you describe a faithful Christian? I was at a preacher's luncheon recently, And one of the guys that was there, one of the ministers that was there, he brought up the statement. He said, you know, recently, he said, I overheard one of our members describing what it meant to be a faithful Christian. And he said, I want to bounce this off of you guys. I I really enjoy being with those other ministers because they want to be better ministers, but they also want to help equip the people that they're working with to be more faithful in their Christian walk. They want to give them the necessary tools in order to go to heaven. And this guy, he he said, you know, this was the statement that was made. He said, well, that person attends Sunday morning Bible class. They attend Sunday morning worship. They attend Sunday evening worship. And they attend Wednesday night Bible class. And therefore, that makes them a faithful Christian. Well, what about Monday? What about Thursday? What about Saturday? If that's all it boils down to in being a faithful Christian is four hours a week, do you know that we've just put God on a time clock? Do you know that we've just made a time clock Christianity? Well, this morning we've been to Bible class. This morning we've been to worship. I've got my two hours in. I've got that ticket punched. I've just got two more hours. I've got to come back tonight. I've got to be here Wednesday night. That's all it takes in order to be faithful. Brethren and friends, there's more to being faithful. It's going to affect our lifestyles on Monday. It's going to affect our lifestyles on Tuesday. It's going to affect the things that we do on Fridays and Saturdays as well. Looking over there at Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. You'll notice there a statement that Jesus is making, not only to those who are following Him, but to those who are listening to them as well. He said to them all, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross on Sundays and Wednesdays and follow Me. Is that what your Bible says? Jesus gives the description here. He said, let him take up his cross daily and follow Me. Christianity is is a lifestyle that's lived on a 24-7 basis. And as we go back and we think about these basic principles of Christianity, we have to remember, we have to understand who it is that you and I 
are and who we're supposed to be on a daily basis, just not on Sundays and Wednesdays when we come together to worship our Heavenly Father. You know, when we turn over to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I live now, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and He gave Himself for me. He's saying there, the life that I'm living, it's patterning it after Him, but I'm doing it every single day of the week. In Philippians 1 and verse 21, he said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and you look at verse 12. And he talks there about being an example of the believers. And he says, Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. Don't let people look down on you because you're young. You can still set the standard despite your age. You set the standard among the believers, those who are followers of Christ. And he says, let me show you the areas in your life. The first one says, in word. Then the second one says, in conversation. Now that almost sounds redundant in the King James Version, doesn't it? To to be an example in word and then also in conversation. Well, that word conversation in the King James means our manner of life, our lifestyle. And so I'm going to be an example in the way that I Live. I'm going to be an example in my lifestyle. I'm going to be an example in the things that I do on a daily basis. When you look over at Philippians 1 and verse 27, Paul said, Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Conversation again, King James, manner of life. Let your manner of life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, That's the first area that we're to be peculiar. That's our lifestyle. But in the second place, we could look at it from the standpoint of our decision making. You see, being a Christian, my decisions aren't going to be based on the world's standards. They're not going to be based on what 99.9% of the population may choose to do on a certain issue. They're going to be decided upon what God's Word has to say because it's going to be the standard of our decision making. You know, sometimes individuals may question us, well, why don't you talk a certain way? Well, why don't you say those things that other people are saying in their everyday language? Well, when you look at Ephesians 5 or 4 and verse 29, Paul said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. When he talks about that corrupt communication, part of that could be those dirty words that you hear so many people in our world using today. And Christians aren't going to have those as part of their language. But then you look at a second idea. Well, why don't you go and do those things on Friday nights that everybody else is doing? Well, why don't you go out drinking with us at the bar? That's not part of a child of God's life. We're going to be distinctive. We're going to be different. Because our decision making is not based upon the standards of the world. When you look at Romans chapter 12, beginning there at verse 1, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now watch what he says in verse 2. He says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that ye may prove what is acceptable, what is perfect and acceptable, the will of God. And so your mind has been transformed once from being in the world, and now it's turned and it's following after what Christ has for you to do. And so our decision making is going to be based upon His standard and not what the world's standard has to say. But but a third area that we could carry this into is in our work ethic. You know, when we look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 11, Paul says, be not slothful in business. And then if you look over to Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, he says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. You know, our employers should be able to say, we can depend on that person. 
And the reason why they should be able to say that is because we're children of God. We know that that person there, that they're going to be carrying their task out on a daily basis. We know that they're going to be fulfilling their obligations. We can depend on that employee there. We can depend on that one there. Because they're following in the footsteps of Christ. Fourth area. It's also going to affect our religious practices as well. We're going to be distinctive in this area. Brethren and friends, the world does not set the standard for what the church is to believe and practice. The religious world is not the standard for what is to be practiced among the Lord's church either. When we look at Philippians 3 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul talked about letting us mind the same thing, letting us walk by the same rule. That idea for that word rule there carries with it the idea of a cannon, a measuring stick, a measuring rod, a standard. And the Word of God was designed to be the standard for those individuals in the first century, and it's designed to be the same standard for you and I in the 21st century. The standard that those individuals had to do in, in Acts chapter 2, AD 33, in order to become members of the church, in order to become Christians, is the same thing that you and I have to do today in 2011 to become a child of God. When we think about some of the practices of the religious world, many of them today will, will have this salvation through what is called the sinner's prayer. You can look from cover to cover, from the Old Testament all the way to the end of the New Testament, and you will never find the sinner's prayer recorded in the Word of God. That's not the standard for what it takes for an individual to be saved. Never can you find an individual, an example of somebody demanding God to come into their hearts. Instead, you see God's Word telling us what we have to do in order to be saved. When it came to the religious practices of the first century, whether it was in regards to, the, to salvation, whether it was in regards to worship, whether it was in regards to morality, the standard that those individuals had at Philippi was the same standard over at Corinth. The same standard in Galatia is the same standard today in South Haven, Mississippi. When we think about our worship to God, Jesus said, God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But what else is going to set us apart from the religious world? What's going to set us apart from the religious groups just down the road? Colossians 3 and verse 17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. I want to give you one other one to think about this morning. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, you remember here that Jesus has got the attention of everyone. The great Sermon on the Mount. And He's got those that are desiring to be followers of His. He's got the multitudes that are there. And He's got the scribes and the Pharisees as well. And He's talking to religious people, or about religious people. And He says, those that are My followers, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Your right doing has to exceed that of the denominational world because that's what sets you apart. That's what makes you different. That's what makes you distinctive. You look at Matthew 7 and verse 21 towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus speaking to religious people again. He says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And so there are so many aspects of our life that are going to be affected by being a child of God. We're going to be distinctive, we're going to be different, and we are going to be peculiar. Let's look at those two New Testament passages on peculiar for just a moment. We begin with Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, and let's notice what the Bible has to say. "...who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity, 
and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, a special people. And watch what He says about us. Zealous of good works. God's people are going to be active people. They're going to be people who are involved. They're going to be people who don't mind serving. When we think about being active in these good works, whenever you hear an announcement made, and there's a sign-up sheet that's out there on the table in the foyer, or one that's down the hallway on the wall, are you one of the first people that goes and signs up if you can help in that particular area? Or do you have the idea, well, you know, somebody else can take care of that. Somebody else can do that. What if everybody had that same idea? Somebody else can take care of it. No work would ever get done. There wouldn't be any activity going on among the members of the South Haven Church of Christ. Thankfully, not everyone had that attitude. Thankfully, we've got those that we can depend on every time there is a sign-up sheet. If there's a work that needs to go on, we've got people that are ready and willing to go out there. But he talks about these peculiar people. He says they're going to be zealous of good works. They're going to be eager. They're going to be, be looking at areas where they can go to work. First Peter 2 and verse 9, four descriptive terms are going to be used about God's people. And he says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You see, God has called us out of the world. And He's called us, He's translated us into the light. In the second place, let's think about this question. What is so hard about being peculiar? What's so difficult about it? You know, human beings in general, we don't like being different, do we? We don't, be, we don't like being considered something that's not normal. We don't, in a lot of time, in a lot of ways, like to be distinctive. We don't want to be considered as being different. I want you to think about the business world for just a moment. There may be some in here that do some marketing in your daily life. Those individuals that are in this particular business, what are you trying to do? You're trying to sell a product, right? You're trying to put a product out there on the market, but when you try to put that product out there on the market, you're trying to say, our product is different. Our product is better than our competitor's product. Our product that we have can run circles around that product. We're trying to show you what makes us different and sets us apart from every other product. Do you know that when we put that in the lines of, of spiritual thinking, God is saying, Christians are my product, and you're special. You're different. You're not supposed to be normal. And the reason why, because you've been set apart from this world. And the design of it is, is to radiate and draw others to me. But so often when we think about this idea of peculiar, we, we think about it as the worst thing that we've ever heard, worst thing that we've ever thought about before. And some have even been willing to compromise their faith just so that they're not considered to be abnormal. Why is it so difficult to be considered peculiar? Number one, because it separates. Over in Matthew 5 and verse 14, Jesus said, You are the lights of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Do you remember what the word church means? The word church means called out. We've been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. Well, we've been called out, therefore we're going to be set apart. We're going to be different. And so number one, it separates. But number two, it renovates. Some of you have probably done some renovations on your houses before. Or maybe you've known somebody that's done some renovations on their house. Maybe they've, they've renovated their kitchen or a bathroom or a bedroom. Well, what do you do when you're renovating something? 
You're making changes, aren't you? You're changing the features of it. In 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, I want to give you a word picture that's being used concerning one of the words in here. He says, Wherefore, come ye out from among them, and be ye separate. That word separate there carries with it the idea of changing alliances. We're changing the team that we're on. We're making changes in our spiritual house. At one time, we were on Satan's team, but we've changed alliances, and now we've aligned ourselves to be on God's team. And so we've made renovations in our spiritual house. And so when it comes to be, why is it so difficult to be peculiar? Because number one, it separates. Number two, it renovates. Number three, it also, it can draw attention. Sometimes it draws scrutiny. Those people are different. Remember that from our introduction. Number two, it draws questions. But I want you to look at those questions not as a bad thing. Look at those questions as a good thing. You have an opportunity to teach someone else and maybe convert a soul to Christ in the process. Number three, third question. How do I become peculiar? If you turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul gives us the answer. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. You become a follower of God, you're going to be distinctive. Because when you're truly a follower of God, verse 2, you'll start walking in love. Verse 5, or verse 8 rather, verse 11 and verse 14, you'll start walking in the light. Verse 15, you'll walk in wisdom. I want us to close by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Paul says, For ye are bought with a price. He lets us know we've been purchased. And the purchasing price was his son's blood. Therefore, glorify God in your body. There's our purpose, to bring glory to God. Number three, and in your spirit, which are God's. We're God's possession. So we've been purchased, we have a purpose, and we're God's possession. As we bring this lesson to a close this morning, we need to remind ourselves Christians are supposed to be different. Christians are supposed to be distinctive because we've been called out of the world into His marvelous light. I want to ask you a question this morning, and it's one that has been asked a number of times, but I don't think it loses its value each time that it's asked. If you were in a courtroom today, sitting before a jury of your peers and your family members, your neighbors, your co-workers, would they be able to convict you of being someone who is different? Being someone who chooses to be a Christian on a daily basis? Or would they be able to find you not guilty? You know that person there? I don't see anything different from them than the next person down the road. I don't see anything different from them than the co-worker that's sitting in the next office cubicle. Which verdict would you have? Guilty or not guilty? This morning, if you're not a child of God, we want to invite you to become one. If you'll believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 3 and verse 16, be willing to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5, making the great confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8 and verse 37, and being baptized into Christ so that your sins can be washed away, Acts 22, 16. You can leave here today as a child of God, a follower of God. Perhaps as you examine your life this morning, you realize at one time I was guilty of being a Christian in my daily life. But now as I think about it, I've lost my zeal. I've lost my passion, and I'm not different anymore. I'm not distinctive. And I'm ready through repentance and prayer to be found guilty once again of being a child of God 
and ready to faithfully serve Him once again. Revelation 2 and verse 10, 1 John 1 verses 6 through 9. If we can help you in any way this morning, whether it's to become a follower of God or to come back to the fold, won't you come forward as together we stand and as we sing?